Hello everyone, welcome back to my zoology class. Last class, uh, we missed just two, uh, two, uh, two uh, small topic of evolution. So I'm just going to speak a little bit about this one and then we'll move on to a new chapter that is the health and disease chapter. That is in chapter 8, okay? So the last one in case of evolution of man, we missed out the, the, a little bit about the ape man and the early human. In case of ape man, I have talked about Australopithecus, which is found in the late Pliocene age, okay? Then next one is Homo habilis, so I've talked about, which is also named as the handyman. Why is it called a handyman? Because they could easily grasp objects okay the next one is called the homo erectus why is it named the homo erectus it was basically named because it was able to stand tall in its feet instead of crawling with with both the hand and the leg okay so they come under homo erectus the ape man that comes under the ape man after the ape man there was another evolution called the early human in case of early human the most common examples were homo sapiens and homo sapien for Fossilis. Remember that the Homo sapiens. It was it was also nom, named as Heidelberg man. Okay, H E I D E L B R G Heidelberg man. Why? Because it has a unique characteristics of having a very large jaw and there was no chin. Remember that. In this case, what happened was that they had a semi erect erect or uh, stooping posture. That means it could not be fully erect. Okay, it was stooping a little bit, but the 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 one the fossil which were the most similar to early human was homo sapien fossilis in this case they had perfect erect posture and they were about 1.8 meter tall besides this their body was less hairy when you look at apes they have lots of hair right so in this case the human they slowly evolve and they start shedding the hair as a result of which in case of human there are less hairs as compared to the apes and then the most probably the most uh important one is that the chin was prominent, the chin developed and the nose became narrow. So this is the present or present human ancestor, okay. This, uh, this all comes under evolution of man. Besides this, now we're going to start a new chapter called um, health and diseases. This health and diseases, it's, it's a very interesting chapter where you learn about uh, what do you mean by health? Basically, when you, when you think about health, the first thing that comes to your mind is that physically you should be strong, right? That you should not have any diseases. But nowadays, when you define health, besides your physical fitness, you're talking about your mental and your social well-being, okay? That means mentally also you have to be you have to be healthy, that's what it is saying. And socially also, that means in the society also you have to be accepted. That is what it is saying in terms of health. Remember that. That is the definition of health. So now, if you define health, then what is a disease? A disease is a characteristic in which a body will show parts or the whole parts having problem, which will start showing symptoms, which will create a problem to the overall structure of the body, okay? Which will lead to the disease. So, when you define disease, that means it creates a, uh, it is creating a problem to the body, be it the brain, your organs, or your various parts of your body. So, what are the agents? Who is responsible for create for you know distributing the disease? They are under the biological agents. These biological agents are also called pathogens. Remember that they are under the nutrients. In case of biological agents, they are those pathogens. Pathogens are organisms which causes disease. They may be in the form of microorganisms like virus, bacteria. They may be in the form of helminths. You know the classification of helminths. You study in class 11, like the round worm, the tapeworm and all. They come under biological agents called pathogens. Okay, basically pathogens are parasites. They cannot survive alone. Remember that. The next one is the nutrient agents. What is the nutrient agents? You have come under, you have the idea of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, minerals, right? So if there is a excess or if there is less nutrient then it will lead to different type of diseases that's what it says the next one is chemical agents it may be in the form of urea in your urine it may be in the form form of uh, pollens which you are allergic to this all comes under the chemical agents which causes disease okay so now we are going to study about 
how the diseases are classified. Then, then where are they classified into? They are basically classified into two types. One is congenital, the second one is acquired. In case of congenital, the word gen, remember that, indicates that it is related with genes. That means it is a disease which is transmitted from one generation to the other and which shows in the next generation, like sickle cell anemia. You know what is sickle cell anemia, right? The, the RBC becomes sickle shape. In case of uh, acquired diseases, they are those diseases which you get it after your birth only, which you acquire it, okay? When you acquire a disease, they are further classified into two types. One is communicable, that means you can transmit the disease. The second one is non-communicable. In case of communicable type of diseases, the most common, that means uh, from a person to person, it gets infected, like examples, measles, in case of TB tuberculosis, in case of influenza, and these days the most common is called the COVID-19, right? They all come under the communicable disease, which can be transmitted from one person to the other, or from, let's say, in rare cases, from, a, from an animal to a human being. Now, in case of acquired diseases, the second one is non-communicable disease. What are non-communicable? Those which cannot be com uh, communicated, uh, communicated from one person to the other. Like the most common example is cancer, right? It cannot be communicated. These are, this all comes under non-communicable diseases. Besides this then, how are they transmitted? How are the diseases transmitted? The diseases are transmitted through direct contact and indirect contact. When you talk about transmission of disease, in this chapter, you are specifically going to focus on the pathogens. Remember that. What are pathogens? Pathogens are organisms, parasitic organisms, which causes diseases. Remember that. So the transmission of disease can be either directly, directly through droplets, like you're sneezing, you have, you have a cold or you have a flu, then the person next to you will get the virus. That is through direct contact. It can be through direct contact through soil. The most common example is, is tetanus, right? Clostridium tetany. That, that, is, that comes under the direct contact where in the soil there is the clostridium tetany. So when you, when you have a rusty iron that goes inside your, let's say that, that pricks your feet and their blood comes out, then you have to get, get injection for tetanus. That, that is one of the main reasons why there is, in this case, there is direct transmission, example in soil. In case of indirect transmission, it can be in the form of vectors. So what do you mean by vectors? Basically, when you define vectors, vectors are uh, organisms which they themselves carry the pathogens, the pathogens, but they do not get infected with the disease. Remember that. That means they, they do not show the symptoms, but they are healthy, but they are the carriers of pathogens. Remember that. That comes under vectors. So indirectly, you will get the disease through vectors. Indirectly, you will get the disease through vehicle borne. That means examples like water, okay, food. How do you, how do you get, uh, what's, what is the most common example of diseases that you get through food and water? You get typhoid, cholera, dysentery. These are all, this all comes under the vehicle borne diseases, okay. So now, besides this, this is just the introduction. So now we are going to focus on all the pathogens which create specific, specific diseases. So the first one is, the first one disease is, we're going to focus on typhoid. Remember that. Typhoid is very common in hot places. Like in case of Nagaland also, you will find lots of people saying that I, I had a typhoid problem, especially in Dimapur, right? So what, what causes typhoid? That is the pathogen. What causes typhoid? Typhoid is caused by a bacteria. What is the name of the bacteria? The name of the bacteria is Salmonella typhi. Remember that. Bacteria are of different shapes. Some are comma shape, some are round shape, some are rod shape. So this bacteria is rod shape. Remember that. Besides this, how are they transmitted? They are transmitted by contaminated food and water by fly. So in this case, what is a fly? The fly is basically the one who 
transport the diseases, right? So it's kind of like a vector, right? So how long does the typhoid stay or the typhoid bacteria stays in the body and then shows the symptom? Okay, that is called the incubation period. So when you define an incubation period, it is the period of the between the first infection and the time where it shows the disease in the body. That is the symptoms. It shows the symptoms. That is called the incubation period. The incubation period of typhoid is usually between one to three weeks. Maybe after one, two, or three weeks, it starts showing the symptoms. Okay. So when you talk about symptoms, in case of typhoid, what are the symptoms? The most common symptom is that you have extreme stomach pain, you, you'll, have, you'll be nauseous, you'll feel like vomiting, okay? And then it will affect your liver also. So this is kind of like an overall cycle that I have made. In this case, what is showing is that this fly, which is carrying, this fly goes to the contaminated food and feces, okay? If the, the why do I say contaminated food and feces? That means those which has got the bacteria, salmonella typhi in it. That means the, uh, the one who is having typhoid problem, okay? When the food and feces, when the feces are out in the open, the fly will go and then it will pick up the bacteria and then it will go to go to the different type of all the houses and let's say it goes to one particular house and goes and eat the food or goes near the milk or near the water. What will happen is that the fly is transporting the pathogen that is the living organism to the food, milk and water. So unknowingly, when the fly comes, you just you know, shoo it away and then you just, let's say you just eat the fruits raw, okay, without cleaning it. Then what will happen is that you are eating the bacteria along with it. When you eat the bacteria along with it, this healthy person will allow the bacteria to go inside the stomach. When it goes inside the stomach, it will, this bacteria will go and target your intestine, okay? The intestine, when, it's dark, when, it, when it goes into your intestine, the bacteria, it causes lesion. Lesion means it's kind of like a blister type, okay? It creates an uh, irritating condition where your, your intestine will get irritated, highly aggravated, and then it will create problems, okay? Like you will have loose motion or you'll have constipation. That means it's creating a problem. So what are basically the symptoms. Basically, the symptoms are high fever within one to two weeks. That's the reason why within one to two weeks, you do a test, the typhoid test. That typhoid test is called the Weidel test. Remember that. This test confirms whether you have typhoid or not. So basically, the first, uh, the symptoms are high fever within one to two weeks, which will go down within the third and fourth week. There'll be lots of body pain. There'll be lots of loss of appetite, obviously, because your intestines is getting agitated and you're not feeling well. Obviously, when you have problem in the intestine, you will not eat food. So when that means you have the typhoid. When you have the typhoid and you do not wash your hands properly after you go to the toilet, then there will be contaminated food because you go directly and touch the food. So it will be like a vicious cycle, okay? So in order to prevent this, what do you need to do? The most important thing is sanitation. That means the toilet should be properly sealed, okay? It should not be an open area. Prevention of contaminated food. That means your food should be covered in a net type or it should be washed properly before eating. Besides this, what is a preventive measure? There is a vaccine, okay? This vaccine is usually, uh, it usually lasts between one to three years, this vaccine. This, in case of this typhoid, it is commonly seen in one to 50 years. That means kids, they, they, show a lot of this typhoid problem. That's the reason why these days, when they turn uh, when they turn like nine months, they start giving this typhoid vaccine, okay? So how do you control typhoid? You can control, that is control it shows, that means when you have the typhoid, what do you do? What medicine do you take? You take ampicillin and chloromycetine that comes under the control method, okay? That is the typhoid. The next one is, The next disease that we're going to talk about is pneumonia and common cold. The first thing that comes to your mind when you talk about pneumonia is that you cannot breathe, right? So what happens? Why can't you breathe? In case of pneumonia, what will happen is that every lungs has got the basic structure called alveoli, right? In case of this lungs, the basic structure 
besides this the ending structure the basic structure is a bag like structure okay is a bag like structure where carbon dioxide comes out and oxygen from outside goes to your body this is like a balloon type so what will happen to this alveoli in case of pneumonia in case of pneumonia what will happen is that they will fill this balloon type with fluids when you have fluids in the alveoli obviously you have difficulty in breathing right so you will feel like you're drowning because you're not getting enough oxygen that symptoms are a part of pneumonia so pneumonia what are the pathogens what causes pneumonia they are bacteria called streptococcus pneumoniae okay that's the reason why these days the kids and all they got pneumonia uh, injections and all when they turn three and a half months one or two and a half months these are the streptococcus pneumonia besides this hemophilus influenzae this is basically a virus okay they these two pathogens contribute to the formation of pneumonia so how are they transmitted you know that basically it's through inhalation of droplets by sputum of patients that means the spit that comes out of the patient if if it is not uh, if they do not put it in a proper uh, area, like in a proper dustbin, it is out in the open, then it will lead to transmission of pneumonia. Remember that. Then besides this, what are the symptoms? The most important symptom is there will be, this is the most important characteristic, lips and nails become bluish. This is in extreme cases, okay? Why do they become bluish? Because there is lack of oxygen okay every every body cells need oxygen so when there is lack of oxygen because of drowning of the alveoli then what will happen is that your lips and nails will start forming bluish color which indicates that there is less oxygen in your body besides it, there will be fever headache and bloody sputum because uh, that means you will give out blood when you cough what is the incubation period the incubation period is very less basically one to three days so what is the treatment? Treatment is uh, the medicine after you get pneumonia. That is, it will, it will be erythromycin and tetracycline. So now when you talk about pneumonia, you think of it as it will be similar to cold, right? But common cold is different. Common cold is caused by a virus called rhinovirus. Remember that, R-H-I-N-O. There are different type of virus, okay? Which causes uh, flu, influenza flu, cold, um, so they are all of different types. So in this case, the common cold, it is caused by pathogen called the rhinovirus. So how are they transmitted? You know how common colds are transmitted, discharge of nose and sneeze from infected person. When you, when you are having a cold and then you, start, you throw, uh, you sneeze and all through a healthy, to a healthy person, then that person will get infected. And then motor transmission is contaminated objects. This is, this is very important. Like you, in case you touch your nose and then you go and touch the doorknob or you, you touch the fridge handle, then obviously the virus will be there, right? So when a healthy person comes and touches the doorknob and then again touch their face, then what will happen is that they will get the common cold that is highly infectious, okay? What are the symptoms? The symptoms are basically in case of common cold, they will work upside only upper respiratory part where they will they will uh, have problem with the nose with the throat okay but it will not go down to your lungs which is commonly seen in pneumonia the symptoms are sore throat runny nose cough and headache okay so nowadays the common cold there's no treatment you just have to take lots of intakes of fluid stay warm and then uh, get lots of rest but um, the next one that we're going to focus on is an important one called malaria. Okay, that is, that is found mostly in tropical and subtropical places. What do you mean by tropical and subtropical places? Places which are, which are, which are basically of very high temperature, high humidity. Okay. Those are the places where you will find malaria. This is also seen in places like hot places like in Nalan, in Dimapur. So what are the pathogens that causes malaria? It is a protozoa, okay? Protozoa comes under basically under kingdom protista, okay? So pathogens plasmodium species 
causes malaria. Why do you say plasmodium species? Because the plasmodium are again of three or three or four types, okay, which will cause different type of diseases. So the pathogen are come, comes under plasmodium species. This plasmodium is a protozoa. What is a protozoa? The one which causes diseases. So how long does it stay? It stays for several days only. After several days, you start showing the symptoms. So how are they transmitted? They are transmitted by a mosquito, a particular mosquito called Anopheles mosquito. That also the female Anopheles mosquito. That is the female, not the male, okay, remember that. So what are the symptoms? You have cold stage, hot and sweating stage. You have heard of uh, malaria patient which started shivering and then they asked for blankets and suddenly after a certain, after some time again, they started sweating, they started having high temperature. These are basically because of the rupture of the red blood cells, okay? The red blood cells in our body. You know the red blood cells are very important to our body, right? So what happens? In this case, what will happen is that the mosquito, that is the female Anopheles mosquito, will go and bite the infected person, means the one who has malaria, remember that. When it bites the infected person, that infected person will have the plasmodium, plasmodium in the form of gametes. What are gametes? That is, that is, Either it will be in the form of male, male and female gametes. Remember that. So when they when they combine male and female gametes, obviously they undergo fertilization, right? So in this case, the mosquito will pick up pick up the gametocytes from the infected person. After it picks up the gametocytes from the infected person, the mosquito will obviously digest the blood, right? That means the gametocytes will go to the stomach of the mosquito. When it goes to the stomach of the mosquito, there the gametocytes, which will be both, gametocytes will be male, gametocytes will be male as well as female. In case of human, it will be, in case of human, it will be sperm and ovary, remember that. So the gametocytes, gametocytes will develop in the gut of the mosquito, that means the stomach part. After it develops, the gametocytes develops, it will go back to the salivary gland. Salivary gland, you know where they're located, right? You know, inside, the, inside your mouth. So in the salivary gland, the gametocytes matures and forms a certain structure called sporozytes. Remember that these sporozytes are the stages in the plas uh, pla uh, plasmodium species. This sporozyte is the infectious stage. These sporozytes will, will then come out from the mosquito through, the, through, the, uh, through, through their mouth and then it will go and infect a healthy human being. After it affects a healthy human being, these sporozytes will go to the liver, your healthy liver, okay? In the liver, they will reproduce asexually. What do you mean asexually? That means it will reproduce on its own without the male and the female gametes. After it reproduces to a certain extent, then it will transfer itself, the sporozytes will transfer itself to the RBC. In the RBC, again, they will reproduce asexually without uh, male and female gametes. Asexually, uh, besides this, they will slowly undergo sexual development. When it undergoes sexual development, what will happen is that the red blood cell, RBC, you know that, you know that RBC is a biconcave disc, right? So, the RBC, what will happen is that the sporozytes will come in, in the RBC. When the sporozytes come in in the RBC, after a certain time, after the sexual development in the RBC, the RBC will erupt, it will burst out, okay? It will burst out. This bursting out of the RBC will release a toxin called hemozoin. Remember that. This is highly highly toxic. This toxic pigment called hemozoin, which will be released. When it is released, this will lead to the onset of the hot and sweating stage where you, you, uh, where you start, uh, sorry, the cold stage where you start shivering and all. These are all because the RBC burst out and the release of hemozoin is seen. Now in the RBC, 
they will undergo sexual development where they will again form the gametocytes, the male and female gametocytes, which will in turn go towards the various skin, the, uh, the near the capillaries and all, the capillaries where it will be easily accessible for the female Anopheles mosquito to undergo the same process again, okay? This comes under the process, the life cycle of malaria, where in case of malaria, you need two hosts. One is man, the second one is the mosquito, in order to complete the life cycle of the protozoa. Remember that, okay? So how do you control it? First one is destruction. Destruction means what? Destruction of places where the mosquitoes are found in large number, like in case of ponds, right? You will see lots of the larvae and all. You will see lots of larvae in, in case of the mapur and all. There are lots of fisheries and ponds and all. So what they're telling is that you can pour kerosene oil so that it will form a layer in the pond. When it forms a layer in the pond, the larva will not be able to get oxygen, so it will die. Remember that. Besides it, how do you destroy the larva of mosquito? You can destroy by introducing, there are certain fishes, okay, which feed on mosquito larvae. So they can be introduced to the ponds. Besides this, there are prevention. How do you prevent it? The first common thing is you put mosquito nets, right? The second one is you put, the most common name is odomos, right? The cream, which will which will not, uh, which will uh, repel the uh, repel the mosquitoes. The next one is the treatment. What is the treatment? The most common example is there is a particular uh, medicine that is being sold widely by India, the hydroxychloroquine, right? So this all comes under the malarial treatment. Okay. This is a major contributing factor for the treatment chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, which helps in which helps in a person who has already has the malaria disease, okay, remember that. Now we will move to the next disease. That is amoebiasis. What do you mean by amoebiasis? What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you talk about amoeba? Amoeba is, you know already that amoeba is a shapeless, unicellular organisms, right? It has got, it moves through pseudopodia. That means fake, fake arms and fake legs. They, they do not have proper arms and legs, okay? So in case of amoebiasis, this amoeba, amoeba type, it also comes under protozoa. This amoebiasis is caused by a pathogen that is called entamoeba histolytica. Remember that. This entamoeba histolytica, they, during the, course of cell division and during the course of their maturation, they formed two characteristic features. One is the trophozoid form, which is irregular in shape during cell division, which has got the contractile vacuoles. You know what are contractile vacuoles for storing food. One is the trophozoid form. And one is the cystic form, which is like an teardrop shape, okay, which has got a proper cyst-like structure, which is a hardened, hardened, hardened structure, outer structure, in order to survive extreme conditions. Cystic form. So, these are the two characteristics of um, this one, Entamoeba histolytica. So what happened is, how are they transmitted? They are transmitted when a fly will go and settle in the feces. Remember that, okay? The feces, which are which have the, the the person will have. Let's say the person has amoebiasis, okay? So if that person has amoebiasis and he goes and he goes uh, he goes to the open toilet and then he he uh, he does his work and then he comes. What will happen is that if it is exposed, then <coughs> the person having amoebiasis will have the protozoa in the cyst form. This form. Okay, this form. This cyst form, which will be taken up by the fly, which will go near the feces. After it, ta it, takes, uh, it is taken up by the fly, by the mouth and the leg part of the fly, the fly will, will, the fly will go to the food and water. Okay, they will go drink water, they will go and settle near the foods. So, the, the, the contaminated food and water having cyst of parasite will be there. So the food and water will be contaminated. After it is contaminated, if you don't clean it properly, another one healthy person, let's say they eat it. So this cyst 
will go to the upper part of the colon, that means near your large intestine. When it goes to the large intestine, what will happen is that they will invade the intestinal walls, mucus, and feed upon RBC tissues and debris. They will feed upon that, okay? After they feed upon that, they will eat that. What will happen? When they eat it and when the mucus are there, it will cause diarrhea and constipation. If there is a diarrhea and constipation, obviously, in the intestinal walls, there will be blisters. These are called ulcers, okay? After that, when the, this person which is having MBBCs, having ulcers and abscess, blisters, they give out the stool, then it will form a vicious cycle all over again. Remember that. So, Symptoms are diarrhea, constipation, and besides this, there's pain in the stomach. What are the preventive measures? You know, you have to be hygienic, right? You have to be very clean. You have to clean your food. You have to clean your water. So what is the treatment after you get amoebiasis? The treatment is the medicine, teramycin and fumagillin. Remember that. So these are some of the diseases that we talked about in the next class. Uh, I will be talking about um, ascariasis, uh, filariasis, and um, ringworm. Okay. So besides this, uh, we'll, we'll continue with the next class. So see you next class.